Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Edmund Bedrosian. His presentation is entitled Demystifying the Role of the Zygomatic Implant. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Bedrosian. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the Academy for inviting me and thank you guys especially to be, for being here at 8 o'clock after a Friday night in New Orleans. That's quite impressive. Thank you. Um, we're learning a little behind, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. But the subject that I was given was the zygomatic implant, and I want to discuss with you the role of the zygoma implant in the field of implant dentistry. But to kind of understand where this implant came from, it is kind of an odd-shaped uh, uh, implant. Is to a good way is to go back and look at the history of it and then discuss the prosthodontic and the surgical uh, criteria for, for having a successful outcome. So what we're really talking about is using the zygoma bone as an anchorage uh, a platform for the implant. Well, why would you consider such a distant bone away from the alveolar ridge? And that's because majority of the patients that were, were treated uh, by P.I. Brandenmark uh, going back about 25 years ago or so, were patients who had resections. So there were cancer patients who had resections, and uh, after the primary disease was at least dealt with, not necessarily cured because most of them were malignant, we ended up with defects. And when you have such defects in this group of patients, let me see if I can make this move. Um, then uh, trying to have an obturator or some kind of removal prosthesis to stay is, is, is almost impossible. So we try to go ahead and place um, implants uh, in bone, and then as you can see in this particular pa patient, the primary surgeon had resected the zygoma bone, so there was nothing that we could do with it. This is the type of patients that we, like to, uh, that we were able to deal with squamous cell resections where their zygoma bone was left. And in this group of patients, what we did was we utilized a zygoma bone and placed conventional implants, hence the zygoma implant. It was placement of an endosteal implant within the zygoma. And then very long custom abutments were made, extending the platform of the implant into the oral cavity for the prosthodontist to grab onto and make their bar to retain the obturator. This evolved into not only just placing conventional uh, implants in the zygoma bone, but experimenting with a new uh, implant, the zygoma implant, which was basically a much longer implant. And the idea was to eliminate the custom abutment. So this way, the implant had the platform in the oral cavity without the need to extend it uh, with a custom-made 25 or 20 or 50 millimeter abutment. By doing so, we were able to treat maxillofacial defects. We were able to treat cleft and congenital defects that otherwise couldn't have been treated and, or were treated with ill-fitting uh, removable appliances and obturators. Then in 1997, we started thinking of bringing this into the uh, intact maxillas. And we started talking about and designing how we can have surgical courses to discuss the treatment of the intact maxilla with uh, the zygoma implant. And, it, and the entire surgical protocol was published in 2001 in the Fonseca's first book, and then now we're updating it with the current concepts that I'm going to be discussing with you today with the zygoma implant. So when do we consider this implant? We divide the maxilla into zones for better communication purposes. So zone one is the cuspid, the cuspid area. Zone two is the bicuspid. Zone three is the molar region, whether there is bone or there's lack of bone, obviously the zones don't change. When the patient has only bone in zone one, cuspid to cuspid, and they're lacking zone two and zone three, then in this particular case is when you consider the zygoma implant. And the final prosthesis that is fabricated on it is a fixed hybrid prosthesis because we intend to internally load the bone, therefore maintain whatever there is left of the alveolus. Obviously, uh, we started this uh, in the mid-90s, and everything was two-stage delayed loading at the time. If the max patient's premaxilla allowed, we placed two, uh, four implants, but the majority of them were severely resorbed, so we were only able to place a couple. So the, the panorex on your left side is the first patient we did in the U.S. that had a severely resorbed maxilla, and we could only get two implants in there. 
This was restored, and there are horizontal cantilevers, and there's some, uh, and the perfect position or the, uh, the ideal position of the prosthetic screw, which would be the central fossa of a posterior teeth, was the complaint by many, by many. And what I'm going to try to do in the next couple of slides is to demystify some of these concepts that the zygoma implant is placed palatal. It is not placed palatal, it's placed on the ridge. The ridge is palatal to the uh, ideal position of a non-resorbed maxilla. And the anterior implants had obviously a significant anterior cantilever because the teeth positions do not change, but the premaxilla shrinks backwards and upwards, as we all know. So just for a minute, let's take a look at a class one edentulous jaw. If you were to take somebody's teeth out who has absolutely no periodontal disease, their jaw would be considered a class one. The black dotted line would be the crest of the ridge, and that's where the implants would be placed. The red dotted line represents where the prosthetic screw access hole should be on a screw retained, which is the central fossa of the molars and the cingulum of the anterior teeth. Well, in a class one edentulous jaw, we place our anterior implants, we place our posterior implants, and then we place our cuspid implant and the other cuspid implants. The Olon 6 concept has addressed all the biomechanical needs of a edentulous jaw. When you have moderate resorption, your implant distribution is about the same. It's when you have a significant resorption where you go ahead and try to distribute the implants in the best biomechanical position and you place your anteriors you place your posteriors, so you get your good AP dis, uh, distribution, and then you come to place your cuspid implant, you notice that you already have an implant there. So in a severely resorbed case, the anterior implants have a dual function. They act as the anterior implants as well as the cuspid implants, reducing flexure of the prosthesis in lateral excursions. So in a situation like this, you have a horizontal cantilever. So the implant is placed on the ridge. The ridge is palatal to the central fossa of the teeth. And you have an anterior cantilever, obviously. So this misconception about the zygoma implant is placed palatally, therefore modifications are needed, is really not warranted. Then you end up with uh, prosthesis that look like this, and in a quad zygoma case, a prosthesis with a significant anterior posterior cantilever. But there are exceptions. Here's a patient that, was, uh, that came to San Francisco uh, many years ago from uh, New York. She is in a provisional. She's had multiple si uh, implants that have failed, and the lack of posterior support was the issue, uh, and that's why she's had remained in provisional for about three or four years. In consultation with her, I was asked to place implants in the posterior maxilla, and obviously, at the time, two implants and a sinus graft was what, what was uh, recommended, but we decided we'll think outside the box and offer zygoma implants instead. And that's what we did. We placed a couple of zygoma implants in the posterior maxilla. And if you look at this case, this is a PFM bridge. And with that, if you did not have the x-ray, you would not know this was zygoma implants. So when the ridge is not resorbed, the implant will behave like a conventional implant underneath the, in the envelope of the tooth. But if the ridge is resorbed, the implant is impossible for it to be under the white portion of the, of the bridge. <clears throat> 